Well, good morning and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. It's good to see each one of you here today. Take your songbooks, if you will. Turn to number 85. Number 85 on this Veterans Day. Let's stand together as we sing Just Over in the Glory Land. 85. I've a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, there will join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land, as the piano plays, get around and shake each other's hands. As you return to your seats, let's sing the third verse. As the last, we'll sing verse number three. What a joyful thought that my Lord I'll see just over in the glory land. And with kindred saved there forever be just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land. Thank you, you may be seated church. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Tommy, my grandson, came in this morning and he's walking down this aisle over here and he saw all the beautiful decorations. He said, is this America Sunday? And uh, so, you know, we got to have a little talk about what Veterans Day is. And he just sat down on the stairs right here and read all the little medallions from each branch of the service and everything that was up there. Uh, just and, and, you know, he understood this is the day that we are thankful for soldiers. I didn't use the word veteran because that's not something he would maybe wrap his mind around. But uh, I know yesterday was the day. But to all of you that did serve or perhaps are serving, uh, thank you so much for what you've done for our country. We would not be here if it were not for the soldiers. Amen. And again, happy to see you. Uh, I've been in the Chicago area uh, all week. My traveling, I think, is all done. I, I never go anywhere, and then it all happens at once. Uh, it was 70 degrees in Chicago when I boarded my plane on Thursday. It was 39 when we landed in Hartford. And uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of amazing. Uh, the, the church there, there was a, 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 a kind of catty corner to cross from their auditorium was a, a federal courthouse. Uh, been there for years and years, and uh, the uh, federal government built a brand new facility somewhere else, and so the church bought that, and uh, so uh, they have a lot of church offices and, and, and stuff in there, um, and the, the pastor has his office there, assistant pastors and so forth. They built a, uh, like a, a prophet's chamber, little apartment, they call it the Mercy Suite, uh, in this place. Uh, I've got the video. It, it was like, wow, I'm moving to Hammond. This place was nice. That's where they put me up. And uh, there's a, a big living room, dining room, and uh, a, a, a master bedroom. And then there's a sort of a workout room where they have ironing board, coat rack, and so forth. And off of that, there are two other rooms, the kitchen and the bathroom. And they are the old jail cells. Uh, they left the bars on them. 
I told Pastor Wilson, I said, I never spent a night in jail till I came to preach at your church. And, uh, but it was, it was a good week, but it's really, really good to get back home uh, to see everybody here again. I saw, how many remember Robin Lanham? I saw him. He has lost 100 pounds. Uh, he looks like an entirely different person. His mom has leukemia. Uh, been battling that for several years and right now doing okay. His sister, Angie, uh, that used to come with them, they, they all live out there in Hammond now, uh, just had cancer uh, and had surgery, and uh, they're saying she's cancer-free. But uh, if you think to pray for the Lanham family, I know out of sight sometimes means out of mind, and it really shouldn't be. But uh, anyhow, I'm glad to see you. Uh, Brother Ron, I didn't get a chance to chat with you. Uh, you just came in. How's, how's your wife doing? Praise the Lord. And she's home. Praise the Lord. Continue to pray for his wife, Ellen Cornell. Uh, and that is a good report. Vanita, always good to see you back. And, and I saw you coming in today. I could tell by the walk that uh, still recovering. And uh, so, but, uh, so be praying for her. Nick Bender, that's Brother Ken's son-in-law, married uh, Rebecca Lacombe. He is in the hospital. Uh, they just moved to New Hampshire. And uh, he's got uh, cellulitis. And it, it's a recurring issue for him. I have not had that. They say it's, a, it's extremely painful. Uh, so be praying for uh, Nick, if you would, please. And then Dave Armstrong sent me a, a text. Um, I guess it was Thursday. Uh, his uncle Howard had a stroke. It's good to see Dave's mom and dad with us today. Uh, but uh, so we, we have him on the prayer list for this coming Wednesday evening. Uh, if you would pray for him, uh, he's, he's doing okay. Uh, he, he's speaking a bit. He's uh, able to eat. He's, he's walking some, correct? Uh, but not fully recovered, but he is bouncing back uh, pretty well at this point. So please keep him in your prayers, uh, if you would. And as always, how many of you have something going on in your life and you would appreciate some prayers or anybody like that? And that's about all of us. And uh, uh, please, please, I, I don't get tired of asking the question because I want us to just know uh, we have a ministry called prayer for one another, and it may be one of the most uh, uh, important things we do for each other is to pray for each other. So please uh, uh, pray uh, like that, if you would, please. And uh, let's go ahead and pray now. Father, thank you for a beautiful Sunday. Um, Lord, just a, an amazing fall morning, and we get to enjoy. Thank you for our church. Uh, these that have come already for Sunday school, everybody that is teaching, serving in a nursery, uh, all of the, the young people that are here, adults in various different classes, would you bless us today and meet with us as we seek to honor our veterans in a little while? Would you help us to uh, do that well? Uh, thank you's not enough, and, and we'll never say or do it just as it ought to be, but help us, Lord, to let our veterans know how much we appreciate what they've done and thank you for them. Lord, uh, I mentioned a few requests today, a few names. Well, Lord, we're glad that uh, Ellen's surgery went so well. Thank you that uh, the cancer was not found anywhere else. The treatment will be mild compared to what it could have been. Bless her recovery. Uh, continue to uh, give her strength. Bless the doctors. Continue to bless Vanita and help her, Lord, to regain her strength, recover fully. Uh, encourage her heart today. Lord, I pray for Nick. Lord, he's a young man, and since he's been a child, he's had heart issues and heart surgeries and in these last six months, it, uh, it seems like almost every time I hear about him, he's in the hospital. Uh, Lord, that's got to get hard to deal with and uh, give him grace and, and, and strength and be with the doctors, help them to clear the cellulitis up uh, quickly. And uh, just please bless him and his dear wife. Be with uh, Mr. Armstrong. Lord, I've never met this gentleman, but uh, Lord, I pray for him and thank you that he's doing better. Uh, be with his family and encourage them. And, and Lord, just help him to have a full and a strong recovery. And Lord, for all the needs represented by every hand that just went up, we need you. And thank you, Lord, that you are not a God afar off, that your hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Thank you, Lord, that even now our prayers are going all the way to the throne of heaven. And Lord, I pray for your grace and mercy and help to be poured out upon each life. Lord, in our class today, would you open our eyes? 
Help us to hold wondrous things out of thy law and to learn and to grow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to be back in the book of Judges today, chapter uh, number 16. It's been a couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in uh, uh, Missouri with Pastor Wilson. And uh, then last week, of course, we had Brother Aaron McCullough with us. And so uh, we've been away from this study for just a little while. Uh, just a couple of things that uh, are coming along. Uh, a week from this Tuesday will be our annual Thanksgiving service. Can you believe that we're only about six or seven weeks from Christmas? Uh, it's just uh, kind of... How many heard when you were a kid that as you get older, time goes faster? How many would attest that that is true? Okay, I, I guess... At least time's going on. I mean, it's better than the alternative, uh, but it's uh, a lot of things coming up, and we have a lot to be thankful for. We, we, we really do. I know, I, I know 2023 has uh, had a lot of trials for individuals and so forth, but God's been very good to us. So we always move our midweek service from Wednesday back to Tuesday night. Some folks are traveling for the holidays and so forth, um, and it's just a time the whole church is together. By the way, even if there's not a kid's program, bring your kids to church. Amen? Uh, they, they need to be in the house of the Lord. When uh, I'll re reference Tommy again. When they pulled into the parking lot today, uh, he, he, he called out to his mom and dad. He said, this is God's home, right? And he was pointing to the building. He's learning this is the house of God, and he's trying to figure all these things out. This is God's home, right? Um, so please be here. Uh, we have, uh, we'll have a lot of special music and opportunity to share some testimonies and blessings maybe the Lord brought into your life uh, in the last year, and that'll be a week from this coming Tuesday. Uh, speaking of Thanksgiving, you'll see there's a box outside the office door. Uh, the teenagers every year uh, collect items to take to needy families uh, for Thanksgiving. And uh, a lot has come in, and we just sort of keep emptying those boxes and so forth out uh, so that we can refill them. Uh, it needs to be a non-perishable Thanksgiving-type thing. You know, most people, you know, they're not going to eat salmon eyes for Thanksgiving or whatever else. We've had some weird stuff come in. Uh, it needs to also be non-expired. Uh, we do look at the dates on things. If it's expired, we have to toss it out, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. Uh, if you can help with that, just bring it in. Uh, and we got about another week to go. I, I think maybe this is the last week, uh, and then they'll be headed out to deliver those. So, um, again, thanks for everybody that's brought things in, and I hope that uh, you, you, if you can, you'll be a part of that. Did you find uh, Judges chapter 16? All right, we are studying the, the, the book of Judges. Um, Israel is at a time in, in their history, uh, and, and for us, we're going back about 3,000 years or so. They conquered the land under the leadership of Joshua. That's what the whole book of Joshua is about. Uh, they divided up the land, and everybody moved into the place that God had for them. And then Joshua passed away, and all of his generation passed away. And sadly, the next generation that came along, the Bible says, they, they didn't know the Lord. Uh, they, they, they weren't there for the wars of Canaan and, and saw the deliverance that God gave. Uh, everything was sort of handed to them. And uh, they, they took everything differently. After World War II, uh, there was a new generation, actually my generation, we we're called the baby boomers, came along. Our parents fought in, in the war. Our parents went through the Great Depression, and they knew what struggle and strife uh, was all about. And many in that generation said, we don't want our children to go through all the hard things that we did, which is nothing wrong with that. Uh, parents always want to give their, their children uh, the best life possible. I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, but sadly... Uh, what happened is the baby boomers, uh, they, they never had to fight a war and they didn't have to uh, go through the depression. They didn't do without it and kind of became a spoiled generation. And that's the generation that burned down college campuses in the 60s and, you know, uh, the free love and the drugs and all of that. Um, and that's what happened uh, in the generation following Joshua and all of those people. And because of that, they went away from God. They, they, they began to worship the gods left over from the people they had conquered in that land. Exactly the opposite of what God told them to do. And as a result of that, 
God lifted his blessing off the nation and their enemies came in and overran them. And uh, they went into captivity in their own land until they finally had enough. Sometimes uh, six or seven years was enough and they'd say, Lord, we, we've sinned, we've done wrong. And then God would raise up a leader for them called a judge. Uh, sometimes a judge was uh, somewhat of a preacher, but most of the time a judge was a military leader who just happened to be a, a man of faith, uh, who loved God, who would not only lead the armies of Israel to cast out the, the ones who had invaded them, but would also bring them back to God and, and put down the idol worship and so forth. Uh, most of them were men. There was one lady who served as a judge. Anybody remember her name? Her name was Deborah, uh, a great lady. She's in the book of Hebrews 11 as a woman of faith uh, and so forth. And uh, so Israel would do fine as long as the judge stayed alive. But the minute the judge died, it's like they flicked the switch and they said, okay, we don't have to serve God anymore. And they went right back to their old ways. And, uh, you know, finally God would say, enough is enough. They go back into captivity. And they continued this cycle for 450 years, over and over and over again. So we've been studying these individuals uh, and, and their faith and what God did for them uh, for, for quite some time. And we've been talking now about Samson. What is Samson known for? His great strength. Um, and so again, um, do, you, uh, do, do we think that Samson was one of these great, big, giant, muscular bodybuilders? Why don't we think so? They were all surprised at how strong he was. And everybody was saying, uh, what makes you so strong? What makes you so strong? By the way, what did make him so strong? Yeah, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. More times that said of Samson than of anybody else in the entire Bible that the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Samson's also in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter of the Bible is a man of faith. But as we've been studying his life, we also notice that there's a lot of things about Samson that just make us go, huh? Seriously? Uh, one of the things that, that we've, we've uh, also learned in this, the only people that God can use are flawed people. And why is that? That's the only kind of people there are. That doesn't mean that God's okay with all of that and, and things are going to catch up with Samson. Uh, but but we, we understand that. And Samson's one of those guys that we, we just don't always get things about him. And so we've, we've seen him from the time he was born. And Angel appeared to his mom, gave instructions about him. And uh, what is the name for the type of person Samson was supposed to be for, from his birth all the way through the rest of his life? A Nazarite. Tell me some things that Nazarites... Um, could or could not do. They, they, they had to by Jewish law. Uh, a Nazarite could not cut their hair. Now, most Nazarites, it was a temporary vow before the Lord. It might have been a month or two months or something like that, at the end of which they would shave their head. But Samson was different. Uh, the, God told his mother, no razors are supposed to come upon his head ever, ever. He's never to cut his hair. And that would make him a big oddity amongst everybody around him. Something else um, that, that uh, Nazarites could or could not do by law. They couldn't have any fruit of the vine, no wine, no grape juice, no grapes, no raisins. They weren't allowed to have any of that. Something else. They could not touch a dead body. Um, they, they weren't allowed to do that. If they did so, uh, they were defiling their vow and they were supposed to actually go and start the whole process over. So a Nazarite was set apart uh, to serve God in a special way. And all of those things about them made them visibly different than the people around them. Now, we're not under Nazarite vows today. For one thing, we're not Jewish. But you do know that we're supposed to be different than the world around us. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 5, ye, talking to the disciples, uh, and not just the 12. There were, there were other people there that day. Ye are the light of the world. Can light and darkness be the same thing? No. Um, so if the, the world's in darkness, that's what the Bible says. If we're just like them, 
there's no light for them to see. There's no light to, to, to uh, point them to Jesus. So we're not Nazarites, and, and uh, aren't you glad we can have grape juice and raisins? Yes. And uh, I discovered hibiscus tea this week. Has anybody ever had that? Supposed to be exceptionally good for you, um, and and uh, so somebody from Hammond sent me home with it, and I made my first round of it. I have no idea why I'm telling you that. It's just good stuff. Um, but we're, we don't have the Nazarite vow, but we're still supposed to be separate from the world and different from them. Um, Samson uh, is one of those guys. Uh, he's already broken his vow once, his Nazarite vow once. Can anybody remember what he did? that caused him to break that vow. Uh, remember, he killed a lion one day that attacked him in a vineyard, and he went by a few days later like a normal young man to see the dead body of the lion, to see what it looks like. Uh, young guys sort of, they're drawn to gross. Uh, and he found that uh, some honeybees had built a, a comb inside the carcass. And the Bible says he reached inside and he took that honey out and he ate and he gave to his parents. They had no idea where it came from. Um, you know, that'd be sort of like getting steak from a garbage can. But uh, in so doing, he, he really broke his Nazarite vow. Nobody knew it. Now, Samson did. Who else knew? God did, but nobody else knew about it. And amazingly, uh, nothing bad seemed to happen to him as far as judgment goes. But Samson is developing a pattern that we'll see. The last time we were together, we were in chapter 16. And we see that Samson's taking a step farther and farther away from the holiness he is supposed to uplift and he is supposed to exemplify. Verse 1, then Samson went to Gaza. Does that name sound familiar to us? Same place then that it is now. He went to Gaza, that was Philistine territory, and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. You know, sometimes as human beings, if we do something wrong, even something little and get away with it, what are we tempted to do? Do it again and maybe do something a little worse. Well, I, I didn't get struck by lightning and, 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 and I got away with it. And, and, and sometimes we do that. The book of Romans warns us against that because uh, uh, just because nothing bad happened to Samson with that thing with the, the honeycomb and the carcass of the lion, uh, the Bible says the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The fact that God was merciful to him should have caused Samson to think, you know, God should have been very angry at me. Uh, I, 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 should, I should be thankful for the mercy of God, but he wasn't. Uh, notice he's taking a big step in the wrong direction. Verse 2, it, told, it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. Cities were walled in those days for protection. At night, those gates were closed so that no enemies could sneak in unawares. They'd have often watchtowers with soldiers around the perimeter of that wall. So uh, they're waiting because if he's going to leave, he has to go through that gate. They were quiet all the night saying, in the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. We don't know why they didn't attack the house uh, of this particular uh, woman or whatever. Verse 3, Samson lay till midnight. And arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. So Samson woke up. I don't know if he had uh, some kind of intuition that uh, something was wrong. Uh, maybe as he made his way to the gate, uh, he may have seen people stirring, heard whispers or whatever. Uh, but somehow Samson found out what was going, and um, obviously, it doesn't say anything about the Spirit of the Lord here, but uh, he just took that gate, much bigger than those doors right there, uh, much thicker, much heavier. They would have had a bar that closed down so that they couldn't be open. The Bible says he just ripped that, the, the doors with a, the side post and everything, just ripped it right out of the city wall. Now, it takes some enormous strength, Right? Um, and he carried that up to the top of the hill, almost like he has this giant shield, that type of thing. And uh, 
The Bible speaks nothing of the response of, of the men of this particular city. Uh, it doesn't look like they tried to attack him. More than likely, they were so intimidated by that show of strength, by the damage to their city wall, that they might have just been afraid to go after him, uh, you know, that type of thing. And, and he takes and carries it up to the top of the hill and just drops it there. Um, and, and he moves on. God's delivered him. Um, that should have been enough in, in that situation for Samson to say, I have sinned against the Lord. I've made things right. But there's a, a saying that we sort of have around here. Rebellion makes people stupid. You know, when, when, when we get in this mindset, I know the Bible says, but, well, that's a bad place to be. It should be, I know the Bible says, so that's what I'm going to do. Amen. But, but our sinful natures can, we can deceive ourselves. And, um, I, I think I, I'm, I'm guessing now, this is, this is my thoughts. I'm, I'm thinking Samson's deceiving himself. He's deceiving himself. But we learned in the book of James chapter one, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Doesn't bring forth life, doesn't bring forth joy. Oh, there's pleasure in sin, according to Hebrews, for how long? A season. And then pretty soon it catches up with you. It catches up with you. And Samson is walking that very, very dangerous path. And uh, we're going to see a little bit more of that. Chapter 16, uh, most of the chapters are very sad a uh, testament to the life of Samson. Look at verse number four. Came to pass afterward. Came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. The valley of Sorek is once again Philistine territory. The Bible says, and the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said, entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, we, we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, we don't know how many men are in this group called the Lords of the Philistines. More than likely, they would be like the mayors of different cities. Um, the Philistines weren't a nation as we consider it today with like one king over them. But each town had their own leader and sometimes they called that leader a king. Uh, for example, in Wallingford, if we were in Bible days, uh, we wouldn't call our, our leader the mayor. We would call him the king. Okay, it was Mayor Dickinson for decades. Uh, you know, King Dickinson. That's how it would be. And, and in Meriden, it would have been the king of Meriden, the king of Hartford, that type of thing. The lords of the Philistines may have been those individuals. Um, and they came to Delilah, uh, which, uh, by the way, we're not sure that Samson married her. He's just in love with her. Uh, there's no evidence here that, that Samson's seeking an advantage against the Philistines like he did in chapter 15 uh, with, with that first girl. Uh, that he got engaged to, um, but, but he's in love with her. She's a Philistine girl. Um, and so these lords of the Philistines come to Delilah thinking, uh, we, we, we've got to entice him. We can't beat him up. Um, we, we can't defeat him because he's got this incredible strength. He showed them that in the, the city of Gaza with the city uh, gates and bars. So they said, you entice him, find out what the secret of his strength is, uh, and, and we'll, we'll deal with that. And if you do it, we're going to give every one of you 1,100 pieces of silver. Uh, that's like saying we're, we're going to give you enough wealth for you to live comfortably from any one of us uh, for the next 10 years or so. And they were all going to do that. So this Delilah is about to become an exceptionally rich woman. Remember with his fiance uh, in, in the first place that he went to in Timnath, um, they just threatened her, said, uh, you, you know, you turn him over to us or we're going to burn you and your father's house with fire. They're doing a different tact with Delilah. Verse six, and Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Obviously, 
Delilah didn't feel about Samson the way he did about her. She loved money. Samson loved her. He's walked into a, a terrible, terrible, terrible situation. And uh, so she, she's coming along, as, you know, the girlfriend, boyfriend type thing. So, so tell me, big boy, uh, how, how is it that you're so strong? Um, I, I was over at the gym yesterday, and there are a couple guys that I know. My barber goes there and so forth. My barber's a short uh, Spanish fella. And uh, he's one of these guys that can wear one of those string tank tops, and, and it, it, it looks good, you know, on him. He's got muscles on muscles. And uh, so you don't question you where he gets his strength. The guy works out like a beast. Samson, they had no idea, so she wants to know this. And Samson said unto her, if they, they bind me with seven green withs. A with is a word we don't really use. It's like... Uh, uh, a, a tender branch of a tree that, that's real moldable, that type of thing, almost like a vine, uh, that type of thing. So he says, if they bind me with seven green widths that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Um, he, of course, he's lying to her. What's the secret of his strength? It, it's his Nazarite vow. And the, the big symbol of that is that his hair's never been cut. Uh, but he comes up with something else, and we're not sure why uh, that, that he did that. Maybe he's toying with her. Uh, maybe there's a part of him that knows that that's between me and the Lord, and, and you're, you're a Philistine, uh, and you don't worship the same God, and you should not be privy to that. Um, then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. We don't know if he was sleeping when this happened. Or she said, hey, let's try that out. We, have, we, have, we don't have any idea. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Oh, they're here, Samson. The Philistines are here. And he break the withs as a thread of tow. Tow is like a, literally a piece of waxed thread is broken when it toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. So Delilah thinks that... Uh, you know, she's got him, and she's going to be a wealthy woman now. The Philistines think that they finally got their enemy where they want him. And she says, oh, the Philistines are on you. And he just gets up, and it, it just breaks it off like it's, it's nothing at all. Uh, we don't know if he went out and beat anybody up that night. Um, I'm, I'm sure they left the house pretty quick. Uh, they weren't going to stick around to give him the chance. And so forth. Verse 10, Delilah said unto Samson, behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. What should Samson's response have been to her? You tried to have me killed. What are you talking about? Uh, this should have been. This is, should have been where he said, "Give me the ring back." This should have been where he wises up and goes home. But rebellion makes people stupid. He's got something in his mind. I can handle this. I've handled it before. By the way, we can't handle sin. Um, my son, one year for youth conference, I think he may have done it uh, on a Sunday morning here. You know, he's got this thing for snakes. He's got two more since he moved to Michigan. Uh, but he brought in uh, his, um, I think it's his boa constrictor that's going to end up being 12 to 16 feet long when it's grown. And Sadie was maybe about that long. Uh, he did this a couple summers ago. And he had that snake curled around his arm and in his hand. And, and so what she was fed, so she's happy. She's not going to bite anybody. And you could have heard a pin drop. There were 200 teenagers in this room that morning. You could have heard a pin drop. Uh, part of that was because some of them uh, were on the verge of passing out because they're scared of snakes. And others, it's just snakes are fascinating. They're just something about them. Whether you like them or not, you're just there. And, and Tim's talking a little bit. He said, right now, Sadie can't hurt you. Even if she tries to bite you, they got a lot of teeth. Uh, it, it's not going to draw blood. It, it, their teeth aren't for that purpose and so forth. Uh, and, and, and you might feel it, but, but generally she's not going to do that because she's fed this snake can't hurt you. Uh, I said, but uh, give it about six or seven years. Let her become full grown. She can kill you. And that's the way sin is. Starts out small. And sooner or later, it has this way of wrapping its way around us. Samson's playing with sin. There ought to have been something in his mind. The alarm bell should have been going off, said, this woman doesn't love me like I thought she did. She set me up and, and so forth. But he's not getting it. 
Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me. I'm in verse 10 and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. The fact that she wanted to know how to get rid of his strength. Man, the alarm bells should have been ringing. He should have been out of there. But he's going to play with a little more. And he said if, unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that were never occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. So Delilah ran out to Home Depot. You know, had them cut her several lengths of rope. Had to be brand new, never used for any other purpose, anything like that. There, Delilah therefore took new ropes, bound him therewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber. So apparently at the bedroom, uh, she let these people come in, and they're just standing around him waiting. Uh, and he break them from off his arms like a thread. Snap. There he is. And you can just see jaws drop. And you can see them jumping out the windows and running for the door uh, and, and all of those kind of things. And you can probably see Delilah red-faced uh, thinking he's really going to be mad at me now. Uh, and Samson, but I, I, think, I, I think in Samson's mind, this has become a game. Sin is never a game. Never, ever a game. Delilah said unto Samson, hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. They say third time's the charm, but not for Samson. She, she comes up with the same line. Uh, he said unto her, if thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. She said, that's how you do it. Uh, it, it is believed seven was the number of completion in the Bible. God created the world and rested. It was in the first week was seven days. Uh, there are seven years in the book of tribulation, seven trumpets, seven, seven vials. The number seven is all through the Bible. Uh, and it was the number of completion. Uh, the Jewish scholars stated that someone with a vow such as Samson uh, would divide their hair uh, into seven different locks, uh, a symbol of the perfection of God, that, that idea of completion. And, and possibly, if you, you figure, we're not sure how old he is here. Uh, we're we're going to guess maybe he's in his 20s or 30s. He's not ever, 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 ever had a haircut. Um, so we're, we're going to guess that that could be quite cumbersome. So they said that they would, they would do that, divide it up and, you know, fasten it and so forth, uh, that way. And he said, you take the seven locks of, uh, uh, weave the seven locks of my head with the web. We'll see what the web is talking about here. She fastened it with the pin. So she's tying them all together and said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. So she Fastened them all together, kind of like a spider's web. She pinned them. But if you will, she tied them to the headboard of the bed. Okay? Um, and she said, the Philistines be upon you. And he got up and he just ripped the headboard out. That guy had some strong roots. You know, I, I, I don't know if, what, if he was using suave for men. I have no idea. Um, can, that almost hurts to hear about that, doesn't it? But he rips the, the beam out, and she's probably ducking out of the way uh, and so forth. And, of course, the Philistines are gone again. That's the third time. She set him up three times. He knows the Philistines are in there because he's chasing them away. They're ready to capture him and, you know, breaks off the, 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 the little uh, uh, twigs and, or the vines. He, he breaks off the ropes, and now it's, you know, he's got, the, he's got this big thing hanging from the, you know, the back of his, his head and so forth. And he knows that it's her. She said unto him, how canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with thee, with me? It ought to have been him asking her that question. It really should have. Thou hast mocked me these three times. Who mocked who? Really, think about it. And has not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. What's the name for what Delilah was doing? She began to nag him. Obviously, this woman had a PhD in it. Daily. The Bible says his soul was vexed unto death. How miserable did she make his life? Think about that. And how foolish of him to stay in a situation that, number one, he knows is against the Bible. 
He knows he's not supposed to be there with her. He knows it's wrong. He knows she's bad for him. But we hear the, the saying, well, the heart wants what the heart wants. Um, we also need to understand the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. We hear the phrase sometimes, well, just go with your heart. No, 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 I can't do that. My, my, my heart is not always uh, where it ought to be. It's not always right. I need to go with truth, and the truth of the Bible does not change. Okay? Uh, Samson had truth. He didn't have as much as we do. We have the whole Bible. He only had uh, the, the, the first maybe six chapters of the Bible, but he had enough truth in those six chapters to know that where he was and what he was doing was against the law of God. Uh, he had to have known that. And, uh, you know, his, he's miserable. Um, when, when people get away from the Lord, I always pray that God makes him miserable. Always. With the hopes, it's not because I'm, I'm angry with them or I want them hurt. I, I want them to realize I was happier when I lived for God. I was happier when I did right. And, and with the hopes that they'll come back to the Lord. Samson's a miserable man. What should he have done? Walked away. Right? Should have gone home. Verse 17. Then he told her all his heart. And said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I've been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. Doubtful that she knows what a Nazarite vow is all about. Um, again, we only get a part of the conversation. He may have explained it all to her. If I be shaven, talking about his head, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man the pressure from Delilah has gotten so bad um, he, he, he she's vexed his soul to death there's not a bit of happiness in his heart but apparently he still loves her and thinks even though she's done this to me in the past if I tell her all my heart that'll win her over to me wrong is still wrong no matter what her motives are still wrong no matter what our justification, if it's, it's, if it's contrary to the Bible, it's still wrong. He tells her the secret. I don't know if he thought she'd do anything with it because he had been so open and so honest with her. Or maybe he just, remember his soul is vexed unto death, maybe he just doesn't care anymore. I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us this. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines and come up this once. For he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. She made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. Now, he must have been a sound sleeper. We don't. Maybe, maybe she gave him something that, that uh, helped him sleep. Uh, and she calls a barber in. Um, uh, I'm going to guess very sharp blade, and they cut off the seven locks of his head. It's first time in his entire life. First time in his entire life he's had a haircut. Um, and the weight of all of that is falling off of him. And the Bible says, and she said, I I'm sorry, she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. His Nazarite vow is crushed. It just, I mean, it just crushed. He, he's, he's, he's gone against everything uh, God had told his parents, everything God had told him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Verse 20, to me, is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. I've been here before. God always got me out of it before. I, I'll, I'll do the same thing. And they're, they're going to go running. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. The word wist, can somebody tell me what that word means? He knew not, he understood, he was not aware, get this, that the Lord was departed from him. It was always the spirit of the Lord came on him, gave him that strength, and he went out and did those mighty feats for the Lord. Um, and he just wakes up, maybe he just got so used to it that he, he started thinking maybe it was him. I don't know. But he didn't know God just 
God got to that point and said, you crossed the line, son. I, I'm, I'm not there. I'm not getting you out of this one. We need to be very careful. I, there was a great preacher. I heard him once when I was a 17-year-old at Hiles Anderson. I, forgive me, I cannot remember his name. He preached a famous sermon called God's Three Deadlines. Um, and uh, that, that uh, you remember the rich man who had, you know, big harvest, and he said, I'm going to pull down my barns and build bigger winds, bigger ones, and, I, and I'm going to say to my soul, thou hast many goods for many years, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. And the Lord said, thou fool, thou knowest not that this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He had no idea. Well, Samson had no idea he crossed that line. Um, he just, he took God's mercy for granted. Please don't abuse the mercy or the grace of God. I'm glad that he's a merciful God, but God's mercy is not a license for me to go do anything I want. Well, God will forgive me. I'll just claim what? First John 1, 9. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. Not that, that attitude is not a Bible attitude. And Samson's done that, verse 21, but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. What a terrible thing to happen to someone, brought him down to Gaza. That's where he uh, spent the night with the harlot, ripped off the, the bars of the gates. Possibly they did this on purpose and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. He's in prison, he is blind, he's bound in chains and fetters. He's grinding, uh, probably grinding corn or wheat like an animal would walking around and around, holding onto a beam in front of him endlessly day after day after day. Can you imagine what it would have been like for Samson to just be reliving? He can't see anything now. Um, and uh, just, just reliving all the opportunities he had to do right, all the things God had done for him and all the things he had done wrong. How many have ever had something that you regret? Okay, regrets are hard to live with, aren't they? And Samson's living with a bunch of them. We're going to stop there uh, at verse 21. We'll pick this up next Sunday. Uh, thank you for being here for Sunday school. We've got guests with us today and probably some more coming in. Go out of your way to make them feel at home. And we'll begin our service in about 13 to 14 minutes.